Welcome aboard Dave Cruisewick. He can be found at Dave's Workbench on Facebook. So yet again, Dave, thank you for coming along this evening over in your part of the world and morning over in my part of the world, um, taking time away from your family to come and chat with me at Model Railroad Techniques. Not at all. Thanks so much for the invitation, Des. So as I said, you can be found on Dave's Workbench and please, I please go across there. He's got some fantastic work, uh, a lot of funny little memes, uh, various other bits and bobs we'll, we'll, we'll talk about on this interview that is just uh, actually a pleasure to sort of lighten up the day, so to speak. So also the first thing I would like to acknowledge is how you and I sort of came to be where we are and how we met time at the Bench to Trends Facebook page, which is uh, the podcast of the Wiley Scale Modelling. I'll put links to that below. Uh, fantastic podcast. Please come along and support the, both Brett and Todd in, in their exploits as well because it's a very, very amusing audio for their podcast. So it's a, it's a, it's a great little uh, community. So Yeah. <laughs> So Dave, yeah, it's a great, great community they've put together. That is beautiful, isn't it? So, hence why we are here where we are today and doing our bit to further this great hobby of ours. So, I know, Dave, you're not a train guy, but can you sort of tell us a little of your background of of your modelling? Sure. Um, yeah, as you said, I'm I'm not really a train guy. Uh, in fact, what I'm working on right now is really a city diorama that will have a static line running through it just for visual interest. Um, but I won't be actually using any live trains uh, until, well, my wife will be retiring in five years. And at that point, we expect to move to our, our last house, if you will. Sure. And at that point, I'll be comfortable actually installing something a little bit more permanent. But yeah, yeah like uh, like Todd and Brett, I'm not really a train guy. I'm really all about uh, the miniatures, mainly uh, structures and scenery. Sure. So tell us a little bit more of your backstory of, of the modeling and sort of how you got into it. Because obviously all the models that, that you build are all majoritively by what i understand or in ho scale so 1 to 87 so why tell us sort of that backstory to that how you got into to the the ho scale side of things for your modeling well i really got into it um you know when i was a kid my dad was kind of a dabbler he never really found a hobby that he stuck with and so for about a year he was into model railroading and so there were of course copies of model railroader around the house and the uh, Walther's catalog. But what really fascinated me were the miniatures and particularly the structures. And I remember sitting in the living room in the evening while the TV was on, uh, spending lots of time just pouring over the tiny little black and white thumbnail photos in the Walther's catalog of Campbell's kits. Lovely. And that's what yeah, that's what really attracted me. It really wasn't the trains. It was the miniatures. Yeah, sure. So fast fast forward to about age 47 or 48, uh, I decided to give one a try. And so I picked up a small Bar Mills kit. Sure. It was uh, Revelia Storage, named after Dave Revelia. Uh, and that was my first kit build. And from there... I kind of latched on to the instructional DVDs that were being produced then by Scotty Mason. And those DVDs really hooked me. I watched those day and night and uh, gradually kind of started from there. And uh, so for about, oh, about uh, 12 years, 13 years now, it's been all HO, primarily structures. And that's uh, that's where I'm at today. I think also the one to eighty seven. There's just a, such a plethora of kits out there as well. Um, as I said, I've only just recently got into the the craftsman kit side of of the game, so to speak. Um, I'm predominantly a, a European modeler. When people sort of always get a little bit surprised why we in American craftsman kits if you're a European modeler, but I just think they sort of sort of complement each other quite nicely. Um, I've never built wood kits to this degree before. Um, I've had a little bit of a dabble with railroad kits and some uh, CCKs. Um, I've had uh, young Jeffrey Grove on on the show before, and it was absolute uh, absolute blast. So um, I just think it's, and then I sort of threw myself into the 
on the sword with the Wiley boys, I suppose, and here we are. So I thoroughly enjoy. I've only built maybe half a dozen, if that, um, maybe only four or five, and I just thoroughly enjoy just working with that medium and what you can do to them, particularly the weathering side of things and how they take the paint compared to traditional plastic, I suppose. Is that what sort of what you find as well there, Dave? Or Absolutely. I was never... I was never attracted to plastic kits, and I suppose I may offend a few plastic kit builders here, but to me, uh, there are a few modelers out there who make plastic kits, structure kits look fantastic, Sure. but in my opinion, they are few and far between. Um, to me, plastic kits never achieve the height of realism that wood or hydrocal plaster kits achieve. Um, I belonged to a model railroad club for a while. I only lasted about three years. And one of the big uh, points of frustration for me was they really were not interested so much in the, in the structures, the towns, the scenes they were setting. Oh. They were really train guys. And so here I was bringing in these uh, craftsman structure kits that I was building for them which are not cheap, of course, but I was happy to do it as a club member. And yet they were just perfectly content with their unpainted plastic structures. Yeah, so sure. after about, three, yeah, after about three years, I decided, well, you know what? This group isn't quite my cup of tea. So I kind of became that lone, lone wolf modeler again. Right. Right. And it's all been, uh, it's been nothing but HO wood craftsman, well, wood and hydrocal craftsman kits ever since. Yeah, lovely, lovely. So tell me about your modeling influences and who would be in the top few, if not the number one, and sort of why you've sort of fallen in love with, with his his art, because that's what it is, purely and simple, it's artwork. Absolutely. You are, of course, talking about George Selios Correct. and his yes. Franklin in South Manchester in uh, Peabody, Massachusetts. Um, he would definitely have to be identified as my number one influence. Sure. Um, at least uh, chronologically, I would have to start with Scotty Mason and his DVDs. But after sure. that, it has to be hands down George and his yeah. work. Yeah, uh, I, yeah, I've only had the pleasure of visiting his layout twice. Once Wrong. in 2017 and then once in 2019 when I visited with a group of uh, patrons from um, uh, Wiley Scale Modeling and from the Modelers Forum. Uh, that was in 2019, and unfortunately, because of COVID, all of those visits had to come to yeah, a sure. crashing. You know, George had uh, open heart surgery last February, so he yeah. and his wife Kath are very protective of his health, which yeah, is perfectly enough. understandable. Yeah. In fact, I just received an email from him today. Let me know how he was doing and everything. Oh, lovely. Uh, yeah, yeah. George's layout is hands down. Uh, I know there are a lot of aficionados out there of John Allen's old layout, but that was really sure. before my before my time. So that yeah, really sure. had no influence on me. It's really George's uh, F and SM. I mean, it is a work of art. Yeah. Uh, I like the time frame, you know, the 1930s. Um, I like his um, abundance, uh, abundant use of structures. It's not all about the trains, which, of course, sure. fits in perfectly, perfectly with, with you. Perfectly with you, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and just his, 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 his weathering, his vision, his overall uh, concept, the way he sets up scenes, for somebody who has never received an arts education, he is truly an artist. Very uh, so, much so. Yeah, hands yeah. down, George Selios is number one. Sure. And I think uh, quickly snapping on his heels, bringing through the, the younger generation, I think uh, young Jason Jensen, I think we could both argue is creating f some phenomenal uh, little back scenes. Well, not back scenes because they're not little, but um, some phenomenal modelling as well. Yeah, I would place Jason as a very, very close number two. Yeah, sure. Right behind yeah, right behind George in terms of influencing me. Uh, and not only is he an artist and an absolute master of uh, scale structure building. He is just a, a heck of a good guy as well. Yeah, he's really, a gentleman. Yep, well, I agree yeah, with that. I'd say we're friends, and um, yeah, he is a very, very close number two. Yeah, sure. I think this is probably what I like about um, this community, I suppose, um, particularly in these times where things are a little, not a little bit, they are very tough. Um, 
Um, actually, we're meant to be in the United States right now ourselves, but due to current events, which we won't dwell on too much, um, we ain't able to come across, unfortunately. And I had all sorts of layout plans uh, or layout visits all prepared, but obviously we'll have to wait oh. until when that all calms that's down. But bad. That's too bad. Yeah, so, but I think... Well, I'm sorry for the interruption, but if, if you know, starting next year when George is ready to open up again, if you find yeah. yourself traveling to this side of the pond, you make sure you let me know. Definitely. And we'll, uh, George, George will absolutely open up for you. Yeah, that'd be lovely. Definitely we'll do that because we're definitely doing, it was going to be a seven-week trip, so it's a little bit whirlwind, sort of west to, west to east, and we're rather large Star Wars fans, so we want to go to Galaxy's Edge at the yeah. Disneyland because I've got two young children that... Uh, Probably want to go almost as much as what I do, I think. So, oh, <laughs> so I yeah, hope you get so, over here. Yeah, so do I. I'm, I'm looking, you poor souls over there in different parts of the world. It's just, yeah, words. Yeah. You know, yeah, I, I, a, I, I do get stuck for words very often, but what we're going through now is, is horrendous. Yeah, it's an so. absolute, uh, it's an absolute mess. And of course, right now, it's just uh, because of the tension surrounding the election. Yeah, things yeah, are just so. crazy. No yeah. train shows, no open houses. Uh, we've all been sh pretty much shut down for since March. Yeah, that's right. So, so hence we are. We're doing little interviews like this, and this has obviously taken off the the virtual side of things. And I I, I don't see this is going to change too much um, to a certain degree. I think what you'll find is people will still do their open houses and layouts, but I think you'll find that video is just going to go straight online for oh, evergreen absolutely. sort of content. So. Absolutely. There's not going to be any going back. I think in many respects, it's like uh, the work from home phenomenon that's taken hold here in the U.S. Sure. I think a sure. lot of companies were maybe dabbling in it a little bit before COVID, but once sure. COVID hit, they were forced to do it. Correct. Correct. And now that they've seen how well it works and yeah. how cost effective it is, I think that's going to become the new normal. Yeah. I think you're absolutely right about podcasts and webcasts like this. I think yeah. they are here to stay, and that's a, yeah. that's a great thing. I agree, because I think uh, no matter where you are in this hobby and what, what uh, floats your boat, so to speak, as they're using a slang word here in Australia, um, I think moving forward, this is this is the thing um, to keep keep this hobby going. I suppose we're, I think it's all our responsibilities to make sure we get the youth in into to the hobby. Obviously, young Brett is a fair bit younger than me. I'm mid forties, um, but I think there's a few sort of around sort of my age. That's that's for sure. So. You have a love of signs. Um, <laughs> yes, I do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop short. No, I'm not going to stop short. I'm going to say the, the big sign, man. You, between you and probably, I think, Jake Johnson, are two that quite regularly put sign signage up on either your Facebook page or Jake's. Um, yes. He's got a, a, a signs one, which I will we'll link below as well uh, for people to have a look at. So... Tell us about where did this passion come from, I suppose, because it's, it's, it's almost a niche within the niche, isn't it, for you? Just almost. You know, to be honest, I'm not really sure where it came from. I, I have to believe that part of it is George's influence. George's sure. F and SM is just riddled with colorful signs. And um, uh, I think perhaps uh, subconsciously that's what kind of got hold of me, that... Uh, the fact that the use of signs can add so much color sure. and can be used to insert a little bit of humor uh, to those yeah. who look closely. Um, and I think it's perhaps just because I'm a kind of a visual person in the first place sure. that signs uh, really kind of really kind of grabbed hold of me. So to share that interest, yeah, I regularly add to a folder of, of signs that <laughs> have tickled me in one way or another yeah, just so yeah. that they're there. Uh, anybody to use who wishes to uh, to partake. Yeah, sure, sure. I suppose, have you ever designed any of your signs yourself? Have you gone as far as your your Jake Johnson's where he's just about mastered the art, I think. Um, I've yet to dabble myself. I, I do like a good sign that, um, that, that you gentlemen are putting up. But have you ever designed anything on the computer or something yourself or just stuff you found on the internet? 
I have not. Uh, I have intended for over a, <laughs> for over a year now to force myself to sit down and learn Photoshop yeah, or sure. a, a free version called Inkscape, which I have loaded yeah. up on my computer here. And um, when it comes to technology, uh, as you've seen for yourself as we were setting up to go here, <laughs> when it comes to technology, I tend to be pretty slow uh, on the pickup. Sure. Uh, so as a result, I think I have been procrastinating, sitting down and learning uh, one of these programs that would help me design my own signs. But I would yeah, really sure. like that. Um, and as I said, I've had Inkscape loaded on my, uh, my laptop here for well over a year. I bought a how-to book. I've watched the videos. But I have yet to bite the bullet and just jump in and give it a try. Yeah. Part of the reason is just i've just always been so busy yeah it's only the last month that i have officially retired oh, lovely. So congratulations now, thank you so now i'm hoping uh that i will be able to free up the time to just force myself to maybe sit down for a day or two straight and just bull my way through it yeah but uh, if you're thinking like my father-in-law when he retired he was busier when he retired than he was when he was actually doing doing his work so all these little jobs around the house and obviously you've already intimated that you know you want to to move to your final final house that you want to live at so yeah. um, that should be interesting and then you got to unload the basement don't you so or pack the basement yeah, up so you know everybody i know who is retired has told me the same thing in fact yeah. jeff grove mentioned from uh, carolina craftsman kits uh, he told me in the the year or so leading up to my retirement, you will not have enough time to do all you want to do. And he's yeah. absolutely right. Uh, what people have told me, you won't know how you did it when you were working, has been absolutely true. Yeah, I feel right. busier now <laughs> than I was before. But that's a good thing. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So it's normally the stuff that you 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 want to do i suppose as well which is always nice so unfortunately i've still got quite a number of years before i retire but you've done the hard yards i've yet to yet to do all that so yep 31 31 years of public school teaching and i am officially done i retired a year ahead of schedule mainly because of covid yeah uh but yes i am now a free man free man <laughs> until in the fact, wife in, i'm sorry in fact it was made official last thursday the first of the month when I received my first pension check. So I guess that made it official. Yeah, yeah. Until your wife puts a, a list of jobs on the fridge when she goes off to work and says they need to be done by the time you get home. So she gets home, I should say. <laughs> yeah, that, that started straight away. when yeah. her, She's a teacher also. And when uh, she went yeah. back to school the, the end of August, yeah, yes, sure. the, uh, we call them in the States a honey-do list. Honey-do this, honey-do that. Yeah. yeah, I like that. That's, that's funny. Yeah. Yeah, that started right away. So yeah, I really don't, I don't have a lot of downtime during the day, which is no. good. Well, you know, she do, if, you, if you're bored, you could be up to mischief, like building models and stuff. So she wants to keep you busy. So <laughs> well, well employed, I, so to speak. Yeah, I'm pretty adamant. And she's always been very, very supportive of this. I'm pretty yeah. adamant about making sure I get at least a couple of hours of modeling in every day. It's what yeah, really lovely. makes me feel that I'm using my time wisely. I mean, a clean house is nice, but uh, making progress on a model... Yeah, gives me more of a sense of accomplishment than yeah. anything else. So, uh, <laughs> Clean sure house, I but get... a dirty workbench. So you bet. Yeah, yeah, I make sure I get at least an hour or two in every day. Yeah, lovely. So, just back on the the signs quickly. Now, I sort of, I suppose, I've looked at some of the signs because obviously, what you, you're modelling a period around 1930s, where I'm with my European stuff. I'm going from more sort of late 1800s to sort of the 1930s um, and I'm sort of thinking regards to the signs of today and why why are they so boring can compared to some of the stuff that you're putting up on your Facebook page um, right, that's a, yeah that's a that's a real good observation so I just think and I'm sort of been racking my brain when I was sort of going through and trying to work out what I was going to say in this interview. And I, the only thing I can put it down to is signs of of yesteryear were the primary way of advertising for a given company or to get a given message out there. Um, 
What it's is that something that obviously now I've got to drop that little bombshell on you. Well, um, is that something that you would look at as well? That obviously, you know, that's the first impression someone had of a business was a billboard sign or something that was on the side of a building. Yeah, I think you've nailed it. Uh, that was the primary means of communication back then, and uh, Jake Johnson could speak to this more. But um, you had to communicate an awful lot in that limited space because that was your primary avenue of reaching sure. out to potential customers and so they put a lot of time a lot of effort and a lot of heart into the Correct. artwork into the copy you know the text yeah um and so uh they the the signs of yesteryear as you put it i think just had a lot more character yeah. because so much more of the artist and the advertising executive were really put into it. Today, the science today, you know, they're all computer generated. That's right. Uh, they rely so heavily on photoshopped images. You can't even tell today what's a real photo and what has been doctored. Sure. Uh, to me, there's there's no comparison between the appeal of yesteryear's signs and today's signs. They they don't even come close. And for that reason, I have never had nothing personal. Oh no, you're you're an early modeler. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I said I have never had any interest in modeling the contemporary yeah. railroad era because I'm simply not interested in yeah, the bland sure. architecture and the bland artwork sure. uh, and the graffiti on rail cars. You know what? I'm creating a world that I would want to live in. Sure. Why? But I want such uh, such bland imagery. But yeah. but that's just taste. I know there are a lot of guys that it's all about the contemporary world, and that's and that's okay. Yeah, I think that's the beauty of this hobby, isn't it? So it's whatever floats your boat, so to speak. Um, I don't mean that in a, in a derogatory term either. Um, you know, <laughs> you're not into trains, but I love the trains, the operational side of things, but I like dabbling with craftsman kits to see what I can do with that as well because I think yeah. that's the beauty of what I find with model trains. I I get bored very quickly. So I'll, I've sort of got all these projects all over the place, whether it's electronics or doing a craftsman kit i've got a cck nickerson's landing that's been taking too long to build but it's just sitting on the bench literally <laughs> to the side of me here um that i need to to finish for my my wharf scene or my harbor scene which i've just finished uh, the track work so so i think yeah that's definitely the, the the beauty of the this hobby so to speak is we can sort of go between even just within a smaller narrower niche you know there's you know you can start yeah. a new kit or start the signs or the weathering or whatever else on, on these various kits that we build. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's what, uh, that's what I thought I would really enjoy about being a club member is I thought that, uh, you know, here you are gathered with a group of maybe 30 guys, each of whom has their particular skill set, their particular niche, whether it be track work, electronics, lighting, modeling. Um, and I really thought that that would be appealing uh, because I would have my little niche. Um, it ended up not working out that way, but that's the nice thing about model railroading. There are so many that's right. layers uh, that um, you know everybody can find uh, an avenue of expression just within this uh, this one hobby. That's right. That's right. So, as you've sort of explained, you're not a train guy but you're heavily into the diorama side of things and you're building dioramas, which will later fit into your your city scenes. So um, so sort of from this bit, we'll start talking, if you're happy about uh, your various interests, I suppose, regarding the diorama. So talk about some of your techniques and sort of how, how you've gone about that. So if you just want to describe briefly about this scene here and what sort of kits they sure. are and the, the oh, influence sure. behind it. Well, rather than just building individual structures that I could later plop into place, I thought it was time to do a, a bigger scene and a street scene in particular. And what I really wanted to do was incorporate as many as I could of the kits of the month from uh, Foss Scale Models, as well as a free kit from Foss that I wanted to use that I had been wanting to build for a long time. So starting way off to the right there, um, you'll see that there is a Jay Santos uh, tattoo parlor along with a um, kind of, it's like a corner shop there. That was, uh, that was, if I remember right, that was one of the free kits that Doug offers 
about once or twice a year with a minimum purchase. And because it is completely covered in signage, and that is the credit to that goes to Doug, that was all his design, it immediately attracted my attention. And so I made my $50 purchase primarily sure. just to get that, quote, free kit. Yeah, sure. And so I wanted to use that as kind of the, uh, the uh, anchor point of a street scene. And so I built that one first and put it right there on the corner so that all of the signs could be visually, uh, visually uh, apparent. Sure, sure. And then um, I thought, okay, what else can I incorporate? Well, right about that time, I received a gift from Todd and Brett Wiley of the uh, three-story structure you see next. And that's the uh, Dog Whiz Pet Store, uh, Dog Whiz Pet Supply. And that was built as a gift for me. And I was lovely, so lovely. taken with it <laughs> that I decided to incorporate that um, right next to that, um, that FOSS free kit. And then walking down the, down the street, working your way uh, left down the, uh, uh, the scene, everything remaining are FOSS scale models kits of the month, which is a program that uh, I'm sure you're familiar with. It Doug began yep, sure. it about a year and a half ago, I believe. And I joined it almost right away. I missed the first month. But uh, I, like so many other members of the Kid of the Month Club, I have a number of them that have piled up waiting to be built. So I decided <laughs> yeah. now was my opportunity yeah, to sure. really turn myself loose on these, gather a bunch of them together and put them together in some fashion. Uh, so what I did was I wanted to create kind of a decrepit scene of some sort. And so I decided to use that Pilcher's Arcade kit that was one of Doug's kits of the month. Uh, as the next focal point. And so from there, I decided, okay, let's make this a closed down family fun park, an old rundown arcade that's now been closed. And it's all kind of run down and overgrown with weeds and trash and boarded up. Yeah, lovely. And, <laughs> and so that, uh, that made up the rest of the block. Yeah. Um, and at that point I was about, oh, about a foot and a half long and, uh, not having a, a, a layout yet, I wasn't quite sure how much of a footprint I could really afford. So I thought at that point I'd better stop there at about a foot and a half, <laughs> <laughs> set it aside, and then move on to something new. And um, uh, I now have a place for it on my city diorama once I get around to planting it. So just uh, yeah, scrolling through some of the photos here and the signs um, as, as you speak of. Particularly, as you said, the, the Jay Santos tattoos and the, the cigar place next door. I love the, the signage on that is just phenomenal. So um, I think of note that you need to, I think we need to discuss as well. We've got a nice little close-up of it now, and not just the haunted house, but the, the fence from, I think it was from Mind Mount Models fencing, I think, yes. that's from, from Ron. So That's correct. Those are from, from Ron Clays. Yeah. So what sort of, besides signage, decrepit, what other features or elements did you want as a must within that little scene or you sort of didn't sort of go that far or you'd sort of planned out roughly with the kits you had and then started developing the scene as you went or was it you had a, a sort of an end, end goal in mind about what you wanted to, to do with this scene? Well, one of the takeaways I brought with me from my two visits to George's FNSM is the ability to tell a story in little tiny vignettes, little tiny yeah. micro scenes. Uh, I mean, George's layout, as big as it is, you can spend days in there and still come across tiny little stories that are yeah. being told using the scale figures, the vehicles, the detail parts. And so I really felt that that was going to be an important part of what I wanted to eventually do as a modeler, be a storyteller sure, as well. Sure. Uh, now, I didn't do as much of that in this scene as I would have liked, but I at least began focusing on that. So there's a scene where there's a cat up on top of the fence and there's a dog kind of uh, barking at it, focused yeah. on it. Um, uh, but that's kind of what I, what I had in mind. I wanted to at least make an attempt at telling some sort of a story. And yeah, so... Sure. Uh, it really kind of reminded me that in everything that I build from here on out, I want to make sure I do that. I really want to emulate that particular sure. uh, element of 
of, I, I don't want to overstate it by saying brilliance, but you know, the true beauty of George's work is that it's, there are a thousand stories, little tiny stories in that layout of his. And I hope yeah. one day to be able to do that. Yeah. And I suppose if you were to ask George, I've never met the gentleman. I've only heard him talk on the, the Wiley's podcast. I'm assuming there's a lot of within his life and that's what we pour into our layouts, you know, little, little back scenes about, you know, something as simple as, you know, you, you might have a dog and a cat and, they quite often bark at each other on the, on the fence, you know, just <laughs> little little things like that that we might add. So, but I can sort of see, I suppose, particularly with this scene, once you you get into your new house in the coming years, and it's set proper, that you will develop that side of things and make it fit with the rest. And that's probably where you add that hyper hyper detail realism, as I call it. Yeah, I hope to. That's definitely a goal. Uh, I try to include as many tiny little details as possible. Again, I'm kind of emulating uh, the lessons I picked up from George. So yeah, lots of lots of trash barrels, figures that are kind of going about their humdrum lives, uh, sure. you know, mailboxes, fire hydrants, street lights, um, trash bins, uh, you know, pigeons. You gotta have you, you gotta, gotta have, have birds. You gotta have pigeons on the road. Gotta have Sculpey. So, <laughs> <laughs> gotta have lots of Sculpies. Yeah. Uh, um, so again, I didn't do as much on this particular scene as I as I would like to do, but it at least got me started. And from yeah, here on sure. out, that's that's part of the goal. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So we'll talk about techniques a little bit because you're one gentleman that I think is in the top few. Um, the way that you that you might weather or use different techniques. So, what what I sort of I have my favourite techniques. I have my favourite techniques the way they come out, but I hate doing them if they. It's like a love hate relationship. Do you? What would be your sort of your most your your favourite technique? And uh, take the signs out of it um, and go every time I that will go on every structure I do because I just love the way it, love the way it turns out. Well, thank you. Um, a, a lot of my techniques I have really learned from people like Doug Foscali and, oh. of course, Jason Jensen. Uh, one of the great things about Jason is he goes out of his way to show us how he gets the effects that he gets. And you, of course, are familiar with his YouTube videos that are just oh. fantastic. And so a lot of what I would call my techniques are really theirs. They're the ones yeah. that... Uh, them to me probably the first one that comes to mind is dry brushing yeah i think when we are new modelers we have a tendency to paint too heavily yeah sure. um, we want to go for coverage because that's we think that well that's what you do in the real world when you're painting yeah. your living room wall you want to make sure you're covering that wall with all kinds of color the problem is in an ho in HO scale, you're going to lose a lot of your detail that way. Correct. And so one of the things I've really learned from Jason in particular is to go light. There is no need to finish a particular color in one go. Apply a little bit very lightly. You can always add more, but it's virtually impossible to take away. Yeah, so sure. that's really fancy way of, of saying dry brushing is one of my favorite techniques and one that I think is perhaps uh, the most important for new modelers to learn. Yeah, I've been sure. mentoring a modeler that lives about two hours away from me, uh, who's just now getting into structure building. And uh, I'm constantly uh, harping on him to lighten up, get more of that paint off yeah, the brush. Yeah. You don't need to do it all in one go. Just apply a little bit yeah stack for a minute and you can always add more so you asked about favorite techniques dry brushing has got to be uh got to be the first one yeah, the sure. second one, yeah the second one is one that i uh picked up from doug foscali in his instructional uh uh videos and that is routinely echoed by jason and that is layering um the best struck the, 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 the finest looking structures out there are the ones that have clearly had their their paint, their color, and their weathering applied in multiple layers. Uh, again, rather than trying to do it all in one shot, apply sure. maybe a 
maybe a base color first and then maybe add your your mud and then maybe add another layer of of grime and then your white uh dry brushing to catch the, the highlights the sunlight and then on top yeah. of that apply your powders so after dry brushing ah the next thing that immediately comes to mind is the use of layers um and i think those would be the two most not only my two favorite techniques, but I think the two most important for any new modeler uh, to learn. And I have to admit, I'm still trying to master that myself. I often have to remind myself to slow down, get some of the paint off of that brush, <laughs> yeah, and take, yeah. it slow. take it easy. There's no need to uh, glop it all on at one time. So those are the first two that come to mind. Yeah, sure, sure. So what would you be your... As I said, there's sort of a love-hate relationship. So the one I like using is I use a lot of corrugated iron, what we call in this my part of the world, um, is a sponge technique with powders I do and all sorts afterwards. I It's probably the most mind-numbing technique, I think. Um, <laughs> probably more to the amount of... Because if you start cutting the iron to a sort of a scale size, you know, you, yeah. you could end up maybe having to color a hundred of these things plus so that's probably yes. one but i like the way that that technique comes up because it almost comes on powdery or well, comes off like yeah. a powdery sort of texture so what, what would be your love hate i suppose uh technique um, well before i hit that i'll just echo what you just said about uh sponge da dabbing that is something that i learned through jason as well yeah and that's a technique that i have come to use a lot in fact i would say that i probably use a sponge to apply color almost as often as I use a brush. Yeah. And what I said about dry brushing, make sure you've got most of the paint removed from those bristles. I have found that the same thing is valuable when you're using a sponge. Get most of the paint off of that sponge first uh, and apply it with a very, very light uh, spare touch so yeah, that you're sure. not lobbing a lot of color on there. Um, so yeah, I agree with you about the sponge dabbing. That's a really valuable, uh, really valuable technique to learn as well. As far as love hate goes, uh, this will probably be a broken record because you've heard this from a lot of people, I'm sure. Todd in particular. Yeah. Uh, windows. I hate doing windows. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh my gosh, especially on a big build. I've been wanting to do a big apartment building kit. Uh, there are two yeah. that are very. One is from Kenny Crump at Casey's Workshop, uh, and one is from Doug at Foss Scale Models, and they would go together beautifully. But they're four or five stories and have a lot of windows, and I hate glazing windows. Uh, I've tried several techniques, and I use both interchangeably. Sometimes I just use the good old uh, acetate plastic yeah. sheet. Um, especially if I have a large area to cover a lot of windows on one wall section, sure. but, uh, typically I will use a liquid product like, um, gallery glass is one that I pretty much go to. I know a lot of guys like to use right. canopy, glue. Yeah. uh, canopy glue. I have trouble with, I get a lot of bubbles with it. So I tend to go with, um, uh, plaids gallery glass, but love hate, uh, I love the look of windows, especially after you uh, insert window shades or blinds, but I hate the process because it's so <laughs> mind-numbing, especially yeah. if you have a lot of them. So that's that's my love-hate uh, yeah, yeah. uh, go-to. <laughs> no, yeah, we've all got them. And yeah, I, in regards to windows, I, I started out sort of undercoating mine first while I was still on the sprue. So not undercoat, yeah, just like a, a rattle can spray, like a primer, and then right. I would, then I would paint them, and I could always, it always take me so long to get the brush marks out of it. And it was just so frustrating. I thought, yes. then I think it was Brett or Todd on one of there, and they goes, oh no, we we hardly use a brush, we just use sponge now. And since that, kicking goals. <laughs> yeah, between it's, that it's... between that and doors, I just sponge, <laughs> yeah, I just sponge them all now. So. I think it was Brett who once said that most of uh, the windows in his structures tend to be all the same color because he too hates to paint windows. And yeah. he's, so he tends to just go with whatever rattle can color he has handy. Yeah, and I was yeah. the same way for a long time. My windows all tended to be the same three colors. Yeah, an sure. off-white, 
which you can get is a is a rattle can, kind of a dark barn red, yeah, or kind of a khaki green. <laughs> and yeah, finally, yeah. it's decided I need to break away from this because all of my windows and trim are the same three colors. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm still I'm still trying to master that painting yeah. painting you know, frames and mullions. Yeah, I, I have a tough time with that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but a so, sponge help. Absolutely yeah, right. the sponge does. I suppose you just got to be a little bit mindful, don't you? Because it can put too much of a texture on it, and then it looks a little bit. It almost looks like it's almost a less is more scenario, and almost it's almost like yeah. a dry brush with the sponge without using the, the brush, but exactly. a dry sponge, I suppose. Um, yeah, that's and that's what I that tends to be my go to now when it comes to once the once the main window color is on, everything else yeah. is done with a sponge, and yeah. it's virtually a dry sponge because yeah. yes the individual spots get too big yeah then it becomes too noticeable and of sure. course the most effective weathering is that which you don't really consciously see your brain sees it but yeah, you don't sure. consciously see you know the dab marks um, yeah, yeah. And, yeah i've really had to force myself to lighten up on the on the, the amount of paint I have on the sponge, especially on windows <laughs> yeah. and doors yeah that we all been there and you've like then you're quickly getting a like a, a Q-tip out and trying to trying to wet it and get it all off and clean it up so before it all dries and means you got to yeah, get a little yeah, file or sand enough. it back or <laughs> so yeah. uh, probably over nearly a year ago now you were I would think given a little bit of a I don't know I can't think of the phrase this early in the morning but uh, by CCK John Grove uh, John Jeff Grove I should say Mm -hmm. um, a little bit of a, a thank you to the hobby, I suppose, is one of a better phrase. Uh, we've got a photo of it now, the Cruisewick Pencil Factory, uh, <laughs> which was a, a three-kit three uh, diorama set that obviously Jason did a video series on, did a lovely, beautiful job on the way he put all that together. And then I think I, think I remember, I think it was Jeff put up a a Facebook page about, or sorry, a Facebook post of a photo when he was looking into the Amazon box when this thing arrived at his house. And I think I was one of the first ones. I think I put up a little comment, little little smart-ass comment saying, gee, I'd like to receive that from Amazon. So um, <laughs> how did that make you feel, I suppose? Um, something to be bestowed in that that type of way, probably one of the top few craftsman kick manufacturers out there i thought from my point of view obviously you're a long long way further on this this hobby in this this niche than what i ever probably will be um i think it would be a damn nice feeling <laughs> to be i can't tell you yeah a humbling uh, yeah you experience. know what? there's a there's a great story about you know the rock star rod stewart who is of course a model railroader yeah and he told model i believe it was model railroader uh in an interview that when he made the cover of Model Railroader, that was a much bigger thrill for him than any Grammy Award he had ever received. Yeah, I did read uh, that. And I, that's how I felt when I saw a kit with my name on it. I was yeah. just absolutely speechless. First of all, I never thought that a Dutch name like Cruisewick <laughs> would ever appear on a kit. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it's happened to me twice now. Um, oh, nice. I'm not sure if it was... Yeah, I'm not sure if it was Jason or Jeff that was responsible for using my name on the pencil factory. So I'll yeah. I'll split the difference and give give thanks to them both. Yeah, yeah. But that was absolute uh, absolute thrill. I think the first time it ever happened to me was I want to say it was the first summer of Doug's Kit of the Month Club. He came right. out with a kit Cruisewick Coal. And it was right. a very, very small coal distributor. And uh, my, my gosh, not only did they use my name, but they spelled it right. So uh, I was uh, okay. <laughs> I was absolutely, absolutely speechless. So, yes. So it, that, that makes sense. Because obviously, I think it, it was a, Jake Johnson did a, a coal hopper with your name on the side of it, didn't it? That makes sense yes. how, the, how that story's come about. So Yes, a priceless, a priceless gift. Uh, uh, I, in fact, I, I've gotten a couple of those. I, you know, Jake did one, and then um, yeah. I think Jimmy Degnan and sure. Jeff conspired and did a whole bunch of personalized coal cars yeah, for a bunch yeah. of guys in the community. Uh, and I'm not really sure who was the uh, 
I don't know. I, I have a feeling it was both Jimmy and Jeff together, but I could be wrong on that. But yes, you're yeah. absolutely right. It was. It's the most gratifying thing to. to yeah, happen I can to only me. imagine. Yeah, can only but imagine what that would feel like. So, but you have, you know, you you've done the hard yards, so to speak. You're more than freely to give up your time with me today. So thank you. Um, you're more than happy to to show people your good, the bad, the ugly modelling. Um, I think that's important that everyone sees it. every every part of the um, of the process. You know, I did a few, I did a YouTube series on my very first model. You know, not that to, that I wanted to brag or anything because I think it was probably compared to what I can do now. It's is rubbish. But I just wanted you know show people the the good, bad, and the ugly. <laughs> of making it. it was just a, a little the little barn the railroad kit barn which the the dannon feeds was the very first kit that i put together and absolutely uh, loved it absolutely yeah, loved yeah. it that, that was one of the first kits i built as well in fact yeah. i did when i when i belonged to the club i hosted a one day introduction to craftsman structure kit building right. workshop and i had about 15 guys who spent about five or six hours we worked through this kit together and it was dan and feeds that we used and yeah, jimmy lovely. degnan kicked in and and donated a, a lot of the kits that we used for that and so yeah, yeah. i have good feelings about that good yeah. memories about the kit. yeah no, it's, a, it's a lovely uh, lovely little kit to sort of sink your teeth into that's for sure and i did it i did enjoy it not saying i did it any did a great job of it but you know, I'll put it out there, put it out there, some some of the things I'd learned from Jason. Um, and, yeah, we move forward from that and we learn, don't we? So that's yeah, learn totally. by doing. So That's what it's all, all right. about, sharing sharing and learning. That's, that's yeah. really what it all comes down to. Now, I put a, um, a Facebook post up a little while ago um, on the, the Overtime the Bench, and I probably should have put up another one to remind that I was uh, talking to you this morning but um or well, this morning this evening your time but uh, Chris Galvin uh responded to it now and he basically says can you can you tell us how you came to know George Silios and did you take hundreds of photos because it's quite you put put quite a regular photo montage up I suppose just about I know, I think it's every Friday and every Monday, I think, from memory, and scattered out throughout the week. So, and he's obviously then further to say that your photos are awesome, and thanks for sharing this amazing modelling with the rest of us. So, I suppose there's a few parts to that question. I sure. want to know, how, how did you sort of get to know George Celios, and how many photos do you have of his layout? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I uh, first of all, I have to. I I really shouldn't say that I'm. I I know George or that I'm friends with George. I mean, yeah, I first sure. met him in 2017 when I first visited uh, sure. with my wife, and then again when I helped coordinate a visit with about 25 or 30 guys in June of 2019. And sure. since that second visit, George and I have shared emails about once a month just to check in and see how each other are doing. Well, but no, uh, so it really would not be accurate to say that I really know George. Yeah, or that sure. we're, I think that would be uh, uh, exaggerating it a bit. But we are familiar with one another and we communicate about monthly. Um, but as far as the number of photos go, yes. When I first saw his layout in 2017, when I rounded that corner after coming up those stairs, I was in awe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and I don't mean to be overly dramatic, but I often think that it must be how art students feel when they go and see the Mona Lisa. I mean, yeah, I just sure. stopped and sucked in my breath. And I, I got to be honest, again, I don't want to be overly dramatic, but I was almost in tears. I was yeah, actually yeah. seeing and this work of art that I had been seeing in books and magazines for years. Yeah, sure. So on the first visit, I took about 300 photographs. Wow. And then I, <laughs> well, that's easy to do now with cell phone correct. cameras. Yeah, uh, correct. You don't have to worry about how much film you're burning through. That's right. And then my second visit, I took about 350, and I probably would have taken more, but... Um, you know, you know, George's open houses are only about three hours in duration. And sure. even though he was gracious to, to stay open a couple of hours longer than that for us wow. in 2018, if you spend your whole visit looking through the viewfinder, you're not Correct. enjoying 
the layout. So I, I about 350. And so um, on the FSM Fine Scale Miniatures Facebook page, which is uh, a product of Jimmy Degnan, um, that's a page that he set up. Uh, it's kind of a fan page for sure. fine uh, craftsman modeling, particularly George's layout, but not exclusively. And I forget how it started. It might have been Dan Raymond who began posting a different picture each day yeah. that he had taken at the layout. And I, I, I don't recall now. I think it's been about two years since I've been doing this. It eventually evolved into I post a good morning picture from George's layout every morning. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it has turned out to be uh, very, very popular. Uh, there are several hundred followers every day that kind of sign in to see what the daily picture is. Yeah, yeah. The problem is I'm starting to duplicate pictures now because of COVID. George yeah. hasn't had open houses. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm really desperate to get back and get more pictures, uh, especially because, you know, having visited it twice, I now know what I would go for during my next yeah, visit. Sure, so sure. Corners and niches of the yeah. layout tend to get overlooked by visitors in their photography. So yeah. I would like to go and get those. Secondly, despite COVID and despite his heart surgery, George has been putting in several hours a day on the layout. And so wow. I know there are, some, yeah, I know there are some updated scenes. There's some freshening up that he's done and the world has not seen those yet. Wow. So, okay. oh, somebody needs to get back there. Yeah. And get Watch this space. <laughs> and then get in space. there with a camera so that he can share his new work uh, yeah. with his, uh, his followers. Yeah, sure, sure. So, Dave, um, i am got nothing more to say, which is very strange. I normally don't <laughs> shut up, but um, I must thank you for taking your time away from your family. And I think special note to, to your lovely wife. I think it's quite... Uh, I did an interview with John Faraka, which is a model... He's a model uh, uh, NMRA uh, master modeler. And he obviously... Oh, incredible. Oh, yeah, yes. so I interviewed him oh, a few weeks ago and his video just went up. Um Always thanks his wife. I'm the same. I think without our significant other half, we wouldn't be able to do what we can do. So obviously make special special mention of, of your wife um, for I allowing... Sure Thank you. So allowing you um, access to me for... A, for a, We've nearly been going an hour here. You'd be surprised. Um, having a lovely chat. So thank you very much for coming on the, the channel this evening. And I look forward to having you back at some stage again in the near future and seeing how this, uh, this city diorama is going. Well, thank you, Daz. I, uh, I love your, uh, your, your podcasts. Um, and thank keep you. it up and uh, I'll continue to follow. Yeah, that's great. be great. Thank you very much. I'll see you next time. All righty. Thank you. Make sure you subscribe. Click that little bell icon to be notified of upcoming videos. Support us on Patreon. Like us on Facebook and Instagram at Model Railroad Technique. 